Godmorgen. So I could give this talk in Danish, um, but uh, this is an international conference, so um, I'm not going to do that. Um, there may be some people here who don't understand Danish, and that's fine. I have actually spotted one. <laughs> Thanks for coming. So um, my name is Mark Seaman. If you want to know more about me, there's information there on blog.plur.dk. And you can follow me on Twitter, on uh, at Plur, if you're interested in, in hearing what I have to say. I mostly just tweet uh, technical stuff, so um, I'm, I'm not that loud. Um, what I'm going to do here today is that I'm going to try to answer a few frequently asked questions. And I'm going to do this in three parts. So in the first part, I'm going to start with one of these frequently asked questions, um, but then I'm not going to answer the question, I'm only going to address why would you want to ask that question, and then um, in part two, I'll you know, put the first question aside and start talking about something that seems completely unrelated, but turns out to be related, and we'll take that all the way through, and then we'll, we'll use what we've learned in part two, and then in part three, we'll go back to the first frequently asked question, because now we have more information, and then we can start addressing that one as well. So if it's a three-parter, that's the plan. So the first question that I'll try to address here is, how do I combine dependency injection with async and await without leaky abstractions, that is? Uh, so that's the, um, that's the requirement here. You know, if, if you remove that qualification, it's not that hard. Um, but if you want to avoid leaky abstraction, it becomes, it becomes a little bit harder. Um, so I'll start by just showing you a code example of what it is that I mean. So we'll just take it slow and be sure that everyone understands where this is going. So we'll start to look at some code. And whenever I show a code example, I prefer very much to reuse the same scenario. So I'm never reusing the code, but I'm always reusing this scenario of, of having to develop an online restaurant reservation system if I can get away with it, and I can here. So, um, you know, this is one of those systems where you want to make a re restaurant reservation, so you find a form on a website, on an app, or something like that, and you fill in the date and all the other information about the res uh, reservation you want to make, and you press the submit button, and that creates a JSON document, and that JSON document gets posted to an HTTP endpoint, and the code that we're going to look at is that HTTP endpoint, so the server-side code that receives that JSON document and decides what to do next. So um, we'll start with the domain logic. So in, in the domain logic, uh, what we tr we'll try to decide is whether or not we can accept the reservation. So here's just the method signature. I'll, I'll fill it in with some code in a little while, um, but I want to talk a little bit about the method itself, what it looks like. So the reservation is a DTO. That's basically just a data transfer object that contains the information from that JSON document. So the name, the email address, the quantity, and the date. Um, and then you might wonder, why does it return a nullable int? Well, the int is a reservation ID, uh, and that means if you have a reservation ID, that basically means you have a reservation. If you don't have a reservation ID, you know, if it's null, then you don't have a reservation. So why might we not always get a reservation? Well, there might be various reasons for that. So let's, let's look into uh, how this actually works. Now, if we are doing dependency injection, we may have injected a repository already. So um, this might be available via a read-only property or a class field or something like that. So I'm not showing you how to inject the dependency. Um, I'm assuming that everyone knows how constructor injection works in 2019, and it takes up space that I don't have for the slide. So that's why I'm not showing you that. Um, but if we have that repository dependency, we can go and start querying it. We can say, how many, uh, please give me the reservations for that particular date. And then we can you know, just uh, calculate the sum of all the quantities. And that gives us the number of already reserved seats. And if we also know the capacity of the restaurant, uh, we can make a business decision. And we can say, well, if we have too little remaining capacity, then uh, we'll have to reject the uh, reservation attempt here, because we're sold out, or pretty much close to sold out, but we don't have enough remaining capacity for that particular quantity. So that means we return null. That means you don't get a reservation uh, ID, and that means you don't have a reservation. But otherwise, we'll call repository create, and that you know, creates, the repository, uh, create the, creates the reservation in the repository, and that also returns an integer, which is the reservation ID, and then that's what we return. So you may wonder, where's the async and await uh, here? And it's not. Uh, I just want to establish you know, the normal dependency injection code base first, and then we'll look at how to you know, add some async and await in a little while. Uh, but we're almost done. 
Now, if we're doing domain-driven design, we might say, well, let's extract this sort of, of behavior into an abstraction. So we might uh, say, let's uh, define an interface called the maitre d that defines that try-accept method. So maitre d is just a fancy wor word, you know, French for head waiter, uh, which is in many restaurants is sort of like the person or the role that makes decisions about you know, whether or not you can accept reservations. So that makes sense. And that, that also gave me the op opportunity to use the circumflex and Unicode characters in code, which is always really a bother, actually. But uh, it's f fun for slides. Um, at the boundary of the application, we may have some sort of you know, controller that accepts you know, incoming HTTP requests. Uh, so how these things normally work is that if you call the method post, it'll handle incoming HTTP post requests. So that's sort of what you can imagine is happening here. And we return something called an action result, which is basically just an interface that models HTTP responses. So don't worry too much about how that works. It's not really important. But if we're doing dependency injection, we might say, let's inject that in maitre d uh, object. And that means we can basically just delegate to that object and say, let's just you know, take that JSON document and delegate to the maitre d. We'll get a nullable ID back. And then we can test whether or not it's null. If it's null, we'll return an internal server error. And otherwise, we'll return 200 OK. So internal server error here is just a helper method that returns one of those action results. In this case, an action result that represents a 500 internal server error HTTP response. And the same thing goes with OK. OK is a helper method that returns a 200 OK response. And you'll notice in the 200 OK uh, response here, we put the um, reservation ID in the, in the body of the response. So it's, at this point, we know it's safe to go ID.value. We can get the integer out of that nullable int. So um, the reservation repository looks like this. Uh, but then you go uh, and you say, well, but this is really a database. You know, our implementation is actually talking to a, a database, and that's out of process. So it really ought to be asynchronous, because that might improve performance. At least it's worth, worth a try and see if we can make that change, and we can measure whether that uh, gives us a performance improvement. Uh, that might actually be a good idea to do. But um, how, do we, how do we make something like this asynchronous? Well, we have to change the return types. These are normal return types at the moment, but you can change them so that they return tasks instead, and then now it's asynchronous. So it's pretty straightforward, except that this is a leaky abstraction. Because you had this interface, and the reason we had this interface was because um, the maitre d object required you know, or needed that particular behavior. So if you're following the dependency inversion principle, it is the client that gets to decide what the interfaces look like, and the client doesn't need this to be asynchronous. Now you're letting an implementation detail leak through into the abstraction. That is the definition of a leaky abstraction. So we don't even have to debate whether or not this is a leaky abstraction, because per definition it is. But then you might say, well, but it doesn't really matter. Could we be pragmatic? And I would probably say, yeah, who are we actually kidding here? We, we pretend that it's a repository, but really we should just you know, own the fact that it's really just a database. So, OK, fair enough. It's, it might not be a big deal. Let's, let's go with this and see where it leads us, because maybe it's not that much of a problem. Now, if we make this change, uh, we can almost, um, or we can very easily fix uh, the problem here. We can just, you know, add async and await keywords, um, you know, strategic places, and that's basically going to solve our problem. Uh, we also need to change the return type to a task, though. But apart from that, that's basically all we need to do. The only problem that we now have remaining is that since we changed the return type of try accept, we now also have to go and revisit the maitre d interface and also change its return type. So at this point, I'm getting a little bit more annoyed with my leaky abstraction, because I could sort of live with the fact that a repository uh, represents something that is almost always an out-of-process resource. OK, fair enough. That needs to be asynchronous. But this is a piece of domain logic or a piece of domain decision, a business decision that needs to be made. Why does that need to be asynchronous? That's odd. You know, that, I'm, I'm sort of, this, you know, this doesn't sit well with me. But uh, let's see where, where this goes. So um, the final changes we need to make is we just need to add uh, async and await keywords to the post method as well. And most modern web frameworks sort of know that if you t return a task, they will run things asynchronously for you. So at this point, the code compiles, and it works, and it does what it's supposed to do. So you may say, well, is this a big deal? Uh, there are some leaky abstractions, and uh, then you say, well, but you ju there's just a few async and await keywords, and uh, that's pr pretty much it. <laughs> 
and I might be inclined to agree. I'm not saying this is bad, I'm just pointing out that there is a trade-off here. Um, but what I've told you so far is nothing new, and you've seen other people tell you this all the, way, uh, you know, all the time. You know, if you have to go async, you have to go async all the way. Um, and the people will often tell you there's no other way. And whenever people say that to me, I'm always like, ah, really? <laughs> um, because there is another way, and you know, the only thing I need to, to do to disprove uh, the first assertion there is just to come up with one counter example, and I can do that, so I can disprove that there, there is another way. I can disprove that there is no other way. Um, so just to be clear, I'm not saying what, um, what I'm about to show you for the rest of the talk is better. Um, I'm just saying there is a different way of doing it, and, but I believe in choice. Uh, if you want to be um, you know, as, as good as a software developer as you can be, it helps to have you know, options. Uh, so basically, if you're not aware of the option, you can't make any decisions. If you're aware of options, now you can make decisions. decisions. So, so that's basically where I am. I believe sometimes what I just showed you is fine. Sometimes I would go with what I'm about to show you next instead. So it's not a, an either or thing. Uh, you can do, well, it is an either or thing, but you don't have to always choose one over the other. All right, so this is part one of the talk, or we're done with part one of the talk. So I'm going to put aside this problem of the, you know, asynchronous dependency injection for a little while, and I'm going to start talking about another frequently asked question that at fir first glance doesn't seem to be much related to what we've been talking about so far. Um, and that is, how do I get the value out of my monad? Now, don't worry if you don't know what a monad is. We'll get to that in a moment. But basically, the short answer here is that it's mu. Um, there is a tradition in um, Zen Buddhist philosophy that we use this uh, response mu as meaning unask the question. Uh, it basically sort of means the question as it's currently being asked doesn't really make any sense and we should start unraveling why are you asking this question and you know, why does it not make any sense. Uh, this happens a lot and it's, there's nothing wrong with asking, you know, a, it's not even a stupid question, it's sort of like a nonsensical question. But if you want an, a Western perspective uh, on this idea, you can read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance or programmers might want to read Gödel Escherbach. Uh, these are two Western perspectives that talks about this concept of mu on asking the question. Um, we see situations like this a lot in, um, when people are trying to learn new things. So if you're trying to learn a new uh, programming language, uh, or if you're trying to learn a new software development paradigm, or just a new library or stuff like that, uh, people will often you know, um, ask questions that don't make any sense. And we often call this the XY problem. Uh, Stack Overflow has a fact that talks about you know, what's the XY problem. Uh, but basically, um, it's sort of the same thing. When you're trying to learn something new, you're always struggling with figuring out how, it, it, how does everything fit together. Uh, and that's not natural. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, but you can imagine that you have some sort of goal that you'd like to achieve, and we'll call that goal Y. And you say, this is what I need to do. And based on what you already know, and may maybe based on some other paradigms that you're already comfortable with, you form a plan for how can you achieve why. And that plan may involve a series of steps, but then you're stuck on one of those steps. And let's call that step X. And we'll say, well, I don't know how to do X. I can't figure out how to do X. So you go on Stack Overflow or somewhere else, and you say, how do I do X? And that is a nonsensical question, it turns out. So people will respond, why do you want to do X? Um, and sometimes people will do that in a, quite an aggressive tone, and that's not very, you know, um, comfortable. But sometimes people will just engage in, uh, in sort of, or try to engage in a dialogue. And if you do that, um, you may be able to communicate what was implicit, that you're not really trying to do X, you're actually trying to do Y. And once the persons who are trying to help you understand that, they say, oh, in, okay, that makes sense in that old uh, you know, style of thinking that you're normally used to, but in this other thing that you're trying to learn at, at the moment, that doesn't make any sense. If you want to achieve Y, you should do Z, and that will enable you to achieve the goal that you wanted to achieve. Uh, so we get that a lot with, um, in functional programming. People sort of ask questions that sort of can be generalized to this one. How do I get the value out of the monad? This sort of keeps uh, coming up all the time. So. Um, the short answer is you don't, but uh, I should probably tell you what a monad is because I'm not assuming that you know what a monad is already. And it's one of those words that have a lot of um, mysticism and sort of uh, people are a little bit scared of it because it's sort of very abstract. But it's not really that hard to, um, uh, 
to understand. So I believe I can uh, tell you what a monad is in about 10, 15 minutes, and you should be able to understand it. It's, it's, not, it's not harder than that. So in short, a monad is a functor you can flatten, and then you go, okay, that's not really well, very helpful because what's a functor? So we have to start with a functor and, and talk about what that is, and then you know, once you understand that, the monad is part is actually pretty, pretty easy to understand. So a functor is a container. It's not a Docker container. It's not a dependency injection container. It's not even a shipping container. It's just a container of data. So we might just illustrate that with a little rigged angle here. But you can think of this as a data type. Uh, in C Sharp, this would be some sort of data type. And it would typically be, no, not typically, it will always be generically typed. So it would be something like you know, foo of t or bar of t or something like that. So it's just a container of, da of data, of values, or, or things like that. Um, and in order for a container of values to be a functor, it must have one other um, quality. It must uh, support what we call a structure-preserving map. So basically, the idea is that you can take whatever's inside the container, and you can translate the con contents of the container, and the result will be a new container that sort of looks like the original one, but with all the contents changed. Uh, so this seems quite abstract, so let's put some values in. So the, um, the example that everyone understands, and you've probably done this a lot in C-sharp already, is just a collection of things. So this might be you know, a collection of integers in this case, or i enumerable of, of int, or something like that. You know, it's, this is one example of a functor. Uh, so a structure-preserving map might be something like where you say, well, let's add one to each of, uh, of those numbers. And now you get a new container, you get a new collection of numbers. But it doesn't have to be you know, numbers to numbers. You can go numbers to strings, or you can go numbers to Boolean values like this one. Now, the, um, the, last, the third example here also illustrates something else, and that is the structure is being preserved in the sense that even though you, you think you know, Boolean values is just you know, false and true, there's only two Boolean values. Why do we need to repeat them? Why do we need to go false, 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 true, true, false? Well, that's because the structure of the original input container has been preserved. Um, and you might find that redundant in this particular case, but that just means you know, there's always, you know, all of these collections have six elements because the original collection had six elements. And the order uh, is determined by the, in the order of the input. Uh, so that's basically what a structure-preserving map means when we are talking about collections. Um, but to be clear, this is just one example of a functor, and I'll show you some other ones uh, later on. So it's not, a functor is not something that implements an interface or anything, it's just an idea. So another thing we might notice is that the output of making that structure-preserving map is, again, one of our data containers, and that means we can use that as an input for another step, so we can sort of chain these things together. Um, and the way that it looks in C Sharp is you could start with a collection of numbers or an array in this case, and then you go dot select. So select is what we call the structure preserving map in uh, C Sharp. Most other languages call it map, but for various reasons, C Sharp calls it select. So here we just take you know, each of the numbers and add one to it. And then we can do it again. So we can take each of those numbers and turn them into strings. And now we just have a, an array of strings. So that's pretty straightforward. This is just how link works. And uh, this has been available, available in C-sharp for more than 10 years. So you probably know this already. But it's an example of a functor. And um, Microsoft, the documentation, doesn't really tell you that this is a functor. So it does a lot of, of very um, Good, uh, the documentation does a really good job of telling you how this works, but it never really tells you that the extraction this is based on is called a functor. Um, so um, you may not realize that you've been using functors and monads for the last 10 years, but actually you have. Uh, so if you look at this, though, you might say, well, why would anyone ask the question, how do I get the value out of my monad? Because this one is a monad. I haven't talked about monads yet, but trust me, it is. And it doesn't, you know, you realize that it doesn't make any sense to ask that question, how do I get the value out of my collection? Well, which value? There's six of them right here. There might be zero values. Uh, how do I get the value out of my empty collection? It doesn't make sense. So people don't ask that question. So people, so why do people still ask the question about how do they get value out of the monad? I believe the, the reason is that you're never really told that this is a functor. You're never really told that this is a monad. So, um, 
I think some people are a little bit unfortunate or unlucky that whenever they encounter the concept, concept of a monad, it's in a different context. And maybe they encountered it in a context that I call unit containers. So this, this is just my you know, homemade uh, label there, a unit container. And the reason why I call it that is because these are data containers that are guaranteed to contain exactly one, uh, one value. So the example that's been around the longest is probably lazy of t. So lazy of t is a lazy computation, and it's guaranteed to contain a value of the type t, you know, eventually when you force evaluation. And I'm sort of ignoring that it might throw exceptions and stuff like that, but if we forget about that for a moment, it's guaranteed to contain a single value of the type t, just lazily compu computed. So this is already a generic uh, data container. Is it a functor? Well, it's not, you know, um, it doesn't have a select method in the base class library, but you can add one. It's, um, it's pretty straightforward to add an extension method that takes, you know, a lazy of t and turns it into a lazy of t result. All you need is a function that takes t and turns that into t result, and the implementation here is a one-liner. Now, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, dwell too much on the implementation of these things because it's the concept I want to get across. So what you can do uh, with something like that is you can start by creating a lazy int, uh, and even though this one has a, you know, blocking, it'll block the thread for 10 seconds inside of it, this entire expression will complete immediately because it's a lazy computation. So it's a lazy event. It's not going to block until you actually force evaluation. And you probably know how that works already. Now, if I want to transform my lazy int into a lazy string, I can use that new select extension method that I just added. And that also completes immediately. So basically, it's just... It just does what you'd like it to do. It, you, it behaves in an intuitively reasonable manner, and that's basically what we mean when we say it preserves the structure of the container. It's just it it preserves the invariance. It's, it'll stay working the way you'd expect the lazy of string to work, and it's only when you force evaluation that it'll block for 10 seconds. So again, it works just like uh, you'd expect a lazy of, of string to work, and if you force evaluation again, it completes immediately because now it's remembered the result from before. So doing that transformation, that you know, calling that select method doesn't change anything about what it means to be a lazy computation. So that is why we say it preserves the invariance of uh, the original container. So all it takes is just you know, adding a select method like an extension method like this. And you can do this with uh, lazy of t, you can do it with task of t as well, and you notice the implementation code is a little bit different, but not much. And now we can basically walk through the same sort of example again, where we can say we'll start by having a task of int, and that entire expression completes immediately. Now it's going to start that task on a background thread, it's, it's going to start running, but you'll get your task of int immediately. And again, you can call x.select to turn the task of int into a task of string, and that, again, just completes immediately. And it's only when you await the string inside the task that you will actually have some blocking behavior, because that task is probably not finished running by that time. And again, if you do it again, it'll complete immediately. So again, this just preserves the invariance of what it means to be an asynchronous task. So everything you'd expect a task of string to, uh, all the rules that you expect it to obey, it actually does that. So, so let's select doesn't change those things. So it's just, it's just well behaved, and that's basically just another way of putting it. So that's, uh, that's a couple of examples of functors. Um, you've seen me write code like this, so x.select uh, and using this you know, method call syntax. Uh, but we could actually also rewrite the code in query syntax like this. And often when people see query syntax, they're, they're sort of used to thinking about this being something that involves i enumerable. So this one would you know, translate an i enumerable of int into an i enumerable of string. But what if x is not an i enumerable? If x is a lazy of int, then y is inferred to be a lazy of string. And the same thing goes for task. So this, um, this syntax that the C Sharp compiler knows about is enabled whenever you turn your generically typed data container into a functor. You just have to add the select method, and then that syntax is available. So even though the C Sharp compiler has, you know, we'll see some examples of this in a moment, even though the C Sharp compiler may never have heard about your generically typed uh, uh, data container type, then you can still enable this syntax. And the reason that this works is because that language feature is based on the concept of a functor. So whenever you do something that looks like a functor, the C-sharp compiler just says, hey, that looks like a functor, um, that syntax will now work. 
So that's basically what a functor is. So I'm just, uh, the only thing that I need to do now is just explain to you what a monad is. And that's actually the easy part. You know, the, the functor part was probably the hardest part to understand. So um, a monad is a functor you can flatten. So the only thing we, we now need to talk about is what does it mean for a functor to be flattened when it's a functor not already flat? Uh, so we'll go back and look at, um, we'll start with looking at uh, collections for a little while. So here's just a single string. So um, um, it's comma separated, as you may have noticed, foo comma bar, but it's one string. And uh, that means we have a, an instance method called split on it when we can call it, and then we can ask it to split on the comma, and that gives us an array of strings. All right, so that's fine. What if we have an array of comma separated strings like this? And we'd say, we'd like to separate each of those strings uh, you know, according to the comma. So you might try to do something like this, where you say, for each of the strings inside that array of strings, I'll call split uh, on that string. Uh, but what you get if you try to do that is you get an, uh, an array of an array of strings. So it's a, it's a nested array of strings. Uh, and this, sometimes this is what you want, but sometimes it's not. You just want a flattened list. Uh, so what you can do instead is, instead of calling select, you can call a method called select many. And the reason why it's called select many is because what happens inside of it produces many values. So for each of the strings, you know, string that split or s that split will produce many strings. So you're selecting for each string, but you're selecting many new values. And you want that to flatten as you go, and that works. Um, and um, now you get a flattened list of strings. So this just enable you to, enables you to flatten as you go. And this select many method is basically, if you can implement, implement that and, um, and it works you know, intuitively correctly, then this is a monad. This, this flattens a list, uh, a nested list, and that's a monad. It's, there's a little bit more to a monad, but this is the most important thing you need to understand. So we've seen an example of how lists can be nested and then you can flatten them as you go. So you might wonder, is this also a thing that might happen to other sorts of functors? So we've already established the task of t is a functor. So uh, might, might it sometimes become uh, nested? And that, that may be the case. So um, here I have two task of ins, and I'd like to try to add them together, but using this new functor uh, functionality that I have already have. So I might try to do something like this, where I say, uh, let, let's go x.select, and then I'll have the integer i inside of that task, and then I can try to sort of add those things together. Um, but uh, since y is also a task, I'll have to await that, so that becomes a little bit um, clunky there. So I'll end up with a, an object z, which is a task of a task of an int, which is exactly one of those nested functors. How do we get the, the integer out of it, by the way? Well, you can go await await z. Sort of like, I, I, you know, when I wrote this example, I said, I wonder if I can do this. And then I tried and said, hey, that actually works. That's funny. Um, but it's not really what you'd normally like to do. It's, it's, it's a little bit odd, even though it works. It's sort of like, yeah, maybe not. So what if you had a select many method, you know, an extension method for task of t? Well, if you had, you can flatten as you go. And uh, then your code would just look like this. So I'm not going to show you how select many is implemented, but it's fairly easy. If you're interested, you can Google it. There's lots of examples of that. Um, but now we have the select many method. N more syntax lights up, so you could actually also rewrite the code like this in query syntax. And so not only does the C Sharp compiler know about functors, it knows about monads as well. It says, well, you can do those from, 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 you know, like Cartesian products of things if you have a select menu method. So all of these things the C Sharp compiler actually already knows about. But um, to uh, reiterate so far, I understand why some people might get into this, um, you know, idea that you, it's possible to get the value out of out of a monad, because for some monads, this is actually possible. If you have a lazy of string, you can get the value out of it. If you have a task of string, you can get the value out of it. And this applies to C sharp, this applies in other languages as well. In, in, in F sharp, we have async of string, you can get the value out of it. Even in Haskell, we have these unit containers where um, you may have a container with things inside of it, and sometimes you can pull the, the things out of them. So there's definitely a subset of all monads where that question makes sense, you know, how do I get the value out of it? Um, but we should still keep in mind that um, the, um, the functor and the monad that I started showing you is just the, you know, the collections, and it doesn't make sense to ask that question. But often people don't realize that that's a monad, so that's, that's sort of the problem. 
Um, where things really start to become difficult for people new to this concept is when you have a container that may or may not contain a value. So I call those semi-containers because they're sort of like look like they may contain a single value, but sometimes they don't. And I think the one that most C Sharp developers are familiar with is nullable of T. Uh, so nullable of T is something where you can, you know, have a nullable ID like this one, and then often people need to uh, write some some if else code where they say, well, if it's not null, I know that it's safe to access ID dot value, and that gives me an integer, and I can pass that as a customer ID in this case into my customer, and then I can return that. Uh, but whenever you write code like this there is also the need for an else branch because you're returning a new customer here. So whatever, you know, host, whatever method hosts this little uh, code snippet here must be some method that returns a customer. So what do you do in the else case? Well, we often see that people don't really know exactly what to do, so I, I don't know. I, I'm just going to throw an exception. Um, and, and the problem with that is, you know, if you put code like this into a method that, that you know, according to its type signature says, hey, I'll give you a, a customer, I'll call that method, and then my code will compile against your code, and I'll say, oh, that's great, everything works, and then I'll try to run the code in production, and then everything blows up, bang, because I didn't realize that there was an exception like that. So if you write code a lot like this, it's sort of like you're putting a minefield out so that it's really hard to actually you know, walk through the code base uh, and, and make sure that nothing explodes, uh, and often it'll do that. So it's not a good way of structuring code. So. Um, what if we turned nullable of t into a functor? Again, the select method is not something that is available in the, in the core library, uh, but you can add one yourself. Uh, but there's one little constraint here. You'll notice that we need to constrain the t and the t result by being a struct, you know, a value type. And the reason for that is that nullable of t itself has that constraint. So we can't sort of escape that uh, constraint. But it does enable us to write code like this, where we say we can transform a nullable of int into a nullable bool, because those are both value types. So that works. But then you'd say, well, this is nice, because there's no if-else things going on. You know, all the else if else stuff is actually captured inside that select method. Uh, so that would give me something that, it, that composes much better. So could I do something similar with my you know, customer ID there? Could I write something like this? And unfortunately, that's not possible because it doesn't compile. And the reason why it doesn't compile is because select has to be constrained for, for both the T and the T result to be a value type. And customer is a reference type, so this doesn't work. Um, but it'd be really nice if we could do something like this. So couldn't we somehow lift that type constraint on nullable of t? Well, we can't, but we can create our own um, generically typed data container instead, and we'll call it maybe, maybe of t, because that's what you usually call it. It's also known as option of t, so if you run into that, that's the same idea. Now, in there's plenty of different ways you can implement this, but here's one way. Uh, we'll have a flag called has item, and we'll have two constructors. So here's a constructor that doesn't take any input arguments. So that means we create an empty, uh, empty maybe of t. So that's an empty data container that sort of you know, corresponds to the case where the nullable of t is actually null. But then we'll have another constructor overload that takes an item and you know, sets that has item uh, flag to true and remembers what the item is in, in another class field there. Uh, so at this point, we already have a, a generically typed data container. So the next question is, you know, is this a functor? And obviously it is, because why would I talk about it if it's not? Um, so we can add a select method. It doesn't have to be an extension method. In this case, we can just make it an ins instance method on maybe of t, and you'll notice it returns maybe of t result. So um, one way we could implement that is just looking at that flag and say, if, if has item is true, that means the item is available. Now remember, item has the type t, generically type t. And we have this little function coming in called the selector that turns any t value into a t result value. So we can call the selector with the item value, and that gives us a t result value. And then we can package that into maybe of t result. So whenever has item is true, we'll, map, we'll be mapping a populated maybe of t into a populated maybe of t result. And if has item is false, we'll just return you know, a, a, an empty maybe of t result. So we'll translate empty maybe of t into maybe, empty maybe of t result. So that's a structure-preserving map. It, it preserves the structure of what it means to be a maybe object. And um, you can implement select many as well. It's a little bit different. But that, that just means that not only is it a functor, it's also a monad. Uh, 
So what can you do with this? Well, it turns out to be super composable, and I'll just show you a little example, and then we'll go back to the async await example. Um, but what you can do is you can say, well, we can create a little helper method called try pass int that starts with a candidate string, and then it'll try to pass it into an integer, and it'll return maybe of int. And you might say, well, why do we need this? Because we have that in the base class library already. We can do int that try pass. But the problem with int that try pass is, again, it sort of it, it forces you to stop whatever it is that you're doing because now you have to call int try pass and you have to set up an out parameter and you have to check, you know, did it return true or false and what do I do when it returns true and what do I do when it returns false? And, uh, you know, that's just a bother. Uh, so what we're going to do here instead is we're just going to say, well, if try pass returns true, we know that we have an integer, so we'll just return a populated maybe of int with that integer inside of it. And uh, if it's false, we'll just return an empty one. And you can do the same thing with other passing things. So we can do try pass dates, exactly the same uh, idea. So um, now, if you imagine that you have a, uh, you have to write a car rental service, and uh, the first thing you're going to do when a user starts using your service is you're calling this uh, method up there called collect date. And what collect date uh, will do is it'll ask the user, please input the uh, date from which uh, you'd like to rent a car. And the user types in a date. Uh, and that returns a string, and then you just um, you know, call try pass date with that string, and then you get a maybe of date time. And the next question you ask then is, you say, well, please input the number of days you'd like to rent the car, and the user types that in, and that's a string, and you pass that string as an argument to the try pass int method, and you get a maybe of int, and so on. You can keep on sort of doing, you know, collecting data in this way. So let's imagine you, that you do that. Now, what you really want to do is you want to you know, compose all of that possible data or hypothetical data into a contract uh, because the contract has some methods that would en enable you to, to calculate prices and stuff like that. So we can do that with the query syntax here. So we can say um, from D and MD, now D is a date time object if it's there. And we can say from I and MI because this is a monad and I is an integer and then you can go select new contract and all of this stuff creates a maybe of contract. And the maybe of contract will be populated if all the other maybes were populated. And if one of them is, is empty, the maybe of contract will also be empty. So this is a pretty nice, well understood, um, easy way to do a little bit of, of input validation if you need to, uh, to. So, so far, so good. But then what people often run into is the, this thing where they say, well, the contract has a method called calculate price. And I'd like to calculate the price because I want to show the customer or I want to show the user a quote. Uh, so you'll often see people trying to do something like this, where they say, um, let's try to declare a decimal Q for quote. Uh, let's see if the maybe contract has the item, and let's try to pull the item out of the maybe of contract and call its calculate price, because I need to call calculate price. This doesn't compile. And, and this deliberately doesn't compile because I designed maybe of T so that has item and item are not publicly available. Uh, this is by design because you're not supposed to do this. Because again, this leads to brittle code because what do you do if that if expression returns false? What are you going to, um, which value are you going to give to Q uh, if, if this turns out not to be the case, if, if uh, has item is false? Uh, are you going to throw an exception again? Are you, are you going to create one of those minefields for me again? You're not supposed to do this. This, this is a, not a good way of structuring code. Uh, so by design, this is not uh, compilable. So uh, we'll sort of need to reset things a little bit and say, well, what else can we do? Well, you could perform a structure preserving map. So you could just say, let's just call select. And inside select, you can call calculate price. And that just transforms your, your maybe of contract into a maybe of decimal. This is some completely safe. There's no if-else things you need to do in order to, to uh, make sure that this works. Either this lambda expression runs or it doesn't, but in either case, nothing is going to blow up. You know, everything is just going to be fine. So um, th this basically answers the question, how do I get the value out of my monad? Well, uh, you don't. You inject the desired behavior into the monad. So what you sort of did here was that I took my uh, you know, calculate price and I just put it inside that select method. And I say, well, if it needs to run, it'll run. And if it can't run, it'll not run. And ev everything is safe. So we're never leaving the monad. We're not pulling data out of the monad. We're putting behavior into it instead. So that's, that's what you're supposed to do.
So that's the, you know, how do I do X? You don't do X, you do Z, and that will enable you to, to do Y. Uh, that's X, Y problem. Um, let's see, how much time do I have? Okay. Now, um, I know what you're going to say. You say, well, but ultimately I need a result, because I need to put something on the screen so that the user can actually see the, the, um, the code, and, you know, I can't put a maybe of decimal on the screen. I need something else. Okay. No, I get it. Uh, it's a, that's a reasonable, you know, criticism here. Uh, let's go back to collections for a little while and say, well, what if you have a collection of numbers, and you say, I'm not going to put all those numbers on the screen, I need a result. Well, you know, if the result you need is just the sum of the numbers, you can just call dot sum. That's a specialized extension method available, and you just get that. So, th so you could do something like that. But what if your requirement is a little bit different? What do you say? What if, for example, you say, I'd like to return the product of all the numbers? There's not a, a specialized, you know, product uh, extension method like the sum one here. Um, but uh, what you can do is there is a general purpose thing that enables you to aggregate, uh, you know, things together. And funny enough, that method is called aggregate. So with the aggregate method, what you do is you give it a little function like a lambda expression up here that says, uh, you know, whenever I have two elements, how do I combine those into one? And in this case, I'm just saying, uh, we'll just multiply them together. Uh, so this will work, you know, without the seed. I'll get back to that seed in a moment. This will work for any populated uh, collection of numbers. Now, if the collection is empty, which is not right here, I know there's six elements, but if you imagine that array was empty, um, that lambda expression would not be able to run, and then the aggregate will throw an exception. But if you use that overload that takes a seed, it'll just return the seed. So it just starts by 1, and it says, you know, 1 times minus 3 is minus 3, and then it goes again, and it says minus 3 times 7 is, you know, minus 21, and so on. But ultimately, in this case, it's super boring. It just returns 0, because that's, there's a 0 there. But the concept of, of trying to aggregate, you know, a, a variable number of elements, we can sort of take that idea and translate it back into maybe. But I'm not going to call the method aggregate. I'm going to call it match. And there was this reason for that, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit uh, later. So it, it looks a little bit different. But notice that this is an instance method on maybe of t that returns a t result. And no matter whether the maybe is empty or populated, we are going to need a t result. That's the guarantee. This is the invariant. And uh, basically, we just have you know, a single line of code here that does that. We say, if has item, that's the flag. If that's true, we know that item is available. And then we have this little function sitting up there that has a weird name. It's called just. Um, there's reason for that. It's sort of an odd name. Uh, but we can just call that function just on item. Item is of the type t. Just turns it into a type of uh, a value of t result. And that's what we need to return. So that's good. Now, if, if the flag is false, we don't have an item, but then we have that nothing value up there that sort of like corresponds to the seed uh, in the aggregate method you just saw, and we'll just return that. So no matter whether we have a populated or an empty maybe, this match method will be safe to call if you give it the appropriate input arguments. Um, so we'll get back to that uh, in a little while. Um, but now we'll get back to the, or we'll start the third part of the talk, where we'll go back to this question, how to combine dependency injection with async and await without leaky abstractions. Because now we know how to do this. Or you may say, well, I don't, but well, I do. Uh, so maybe you don't yet, but in 10 minutes you will. All right, so uh, we, um, we, we came from this um, situation where we um, were told that when you do async, it has to be async all the way. And that is true, but there's a way we can sort of invert how things work uh, so that uh, our business logic doesn't have to be asynchronous. Um, and the um, overall idea is that we move what we... This is sort of like a catchphrase in, in functional programming, move impure operations to the boundary of the system. Um, but uh, what we do here is... Um, actually also a good idea in uh, object-oriented programming, because the idea is that we just take, you know, whatever interacts with the real world, and we put that at the boundary of the system. And this is known as the port and adapters architecture, which is a well-known object-oriented architecture. So we're still, you know, on familiar ground, or we ought to, to believe that we are. Now, what's an impure operation? I haven't told you. Uh, but I'm just trying to illustrate that by examples, because there's two ways an operation can be impure. And we have, both, we have examples of both of those ways in this try-accept method that belongs to the matrix D object here. Uh, so I'll just talk about impure operations by way of example. Uh, the first one is read reservations. Um, 
a function should all normally be pure, but uh, one way it, it, can't, uh, it can be impure is if it's non-deterministic. Uh, so um, determinism is something we define by saying, well, if a function always returns the same output for the same input, then we say that that function is deterministic. You know, 2 plus 2 is always 4, so that sort of seems reasonable. Um, but when you call uh, something like read reservations on a repository, and that's, that's going to go and query a database, and it's, it's going to say, well, okay, whatever is in the database, that's what you're going to get returned. You can now call that method multiple times, and it may give you different responses, even though the input is the same, because the state of the database is changing in the meantime. And we don't consider the state of the database to be part of the function. Uh, so for that matter, we consider such a function or such an operation to be impure because it's non-deterministic. So we want to move this to the boundary of the system. And you know what the boundary of the system is, uh, I'll get back to that. But that's basically the post method. Now we have another example where um, something is impure. And that's the create method. And this one is impure for a different reason. And this is impure because what the create method does, it, it creates the res res reservation in the repository, so it probably adds a row to the database. Um, so doing something like that is a side effect, and that means every time you call that method, you, in, you, know, you incur a side effect. Uh, and that's another reason why we would consider things to be impure. Uh, so both of these things, would, 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 I don't want to get rid of them because this is required behavior. We need this software to behave in this particular way, but I just don't want to have those method calls sitting in that try accept method. I want to move them to another part of my system architecture. So we'll start with the first one because this one is the easiest one to, to move. You'll notice that um, this method call always happens. There's no conditions that guards against whether or not this is possible. This always happens. So you might say, why does the try accept method even need to do this? Why is it that object's responsibility? It just wants to make a business decision. Why does it need to go and sort of pretend that it's interacting with the database? Couldn't we just make that a requirement uh, for calling the try accept method that that data is available and we don't really care where the data comes from? So we could. We can just, you know, instead of calling the method, we'll just say, well, that data, those reservations should be part of, you know, the uh, arguments that you supply uh, in order to call the try accept method. So that's pretty easy. Now, there's one problem, though. You know, sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. And the, the problem now is that in order for everything to um, compile, we'll have to change the IMHRD interface because I added that argument to the try accept method. Uh, and uh, you know it has to. I also have to add it here to the interface. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So um, at this point, if you say, "Well, you know, this is a leaky abstraction," if I've ever seen one, if that would be your counter to my maneuver doing this, I would completely agree. Yes, this is a leaky abstraction. Now I'm only doing, you know, I'm doing a series of refactorings, and I'm only started on it, and, and I'm going to do more. Uh, so this is just the first step towards something better. But right now it looks pretty bad. So just trust me, it's going to be better um, once we, um, once I'm done with all the refactoring. So we'll just move on and pretend nothing happened. Um, but if we do something like this, uh, we can go to the boundary of the system. This is where we receive the incoming JSON document. And we could say, well, we already have IMHRD inje injected. We might as well just inject the repository as well. If we do that, we can call you know, read reservations here. So I just move the method call uh, to that method instead. And then you know, I can pass those reservations as an input argument to try accept. And re the rest of the code is the same. So, so that wasn't hard. It's just a, a question of where do you think that responsibility should lie? And there's a lot of um, reasons why you might actually argue that this it sits better here. Um, you might disagree, but uh, we can always take that discussion you know, the rest of the day if you, if you want to. Um, so, um, so that's one of the impure operations now moved to the boundary of the system. Uh, so we'll need to go back and look at the other one. I just want to remind you of one thing before we move on. Um, after we've called try accept, we have this nullable uh, int and you'll notice, uh, just remember that we're doing a check on whether it's null. And um, if we decide that it's not null, it's OK to access id.value to get the reservation ID out of it. And that's what needs to go into the 200 OK response. Uh, we're going to make some changes here. So it's just important that you remember that that's, we need to retain that behavior. All right. So um, 
how do we move repository create to the boundary of the system? This one is a little bit harder because there is a condition uh, that might prevent this from happening. This doesn't happen all the time. This only happens some of the times. So um, if we want to move repository create to the boundary of the system, we need to communicate our decision so that you know, the caller of try accept can say, well, uh, if we decided to accept the reservation, we should call repository create. And if we decided not to, we shouldn't. So how do we communicate our decision to the caller of this method? Well, we, we already do that because we return this nullable of int. That's how we've communicated it so far. I said, well, if you get an integer, you have a reservation. If you don't get an integer, you don't. Um, but the problem with this is that if I move the repo I'll, I'll go back here. If I, move, if I move repository create to the boundary of the system, you know, that method, that is the method that produces the integer. Uh, in a, if, if I move create to another place, I will no longer have an integer. So I have this problem that right now I'm returning nullable of int, and that's fine. But in general, we have this problem with nullable of t, is that t must be a struct. So if I want to use this type of signal, signaling, but I want to return something that is not a value type, I can't use nullable of t. But I could use maybe of t. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change my nullable of int into a maybe of int just to make sure that the next step in my refactorings can uh, work as intended. Uh, but the first step is just going to be this one. So if you just pay attention to the top line there where you can see the return value is a task of a nullable of int, I'm going to change that to a task of a maybe of int. And the only thing that's, that really changed was just that instead of returning null, I'm returning a, an empty maybe of int. And uh, in the bottom there, instead of just returning the int and that gets you know, converted into an nullable of int, I now take the ID that, get, that I get from the create method and I wrap that in a populated maybe of int. So um, this still requires me to change the IMHD interface. And again, you know, we'll just pretend that nothing happened here. It's not interesting to look at. We'll just move on and see what happens. Now, um, the problem that we're having now is that um, the um, return type of try accept is a maybe of int. And as you remember before, what we did is we checked whether it was null or not, and only if we decided that it was not null, we could now go id.value. So basically what we did before, we tried to get the value out of the monad, you know, the nullable of t. But I very deliberately designed maybe so that that's not possible. So how do we deal with this? Well, this is where that match method comes in. So we'll just kind of call, you know, return, uh, we'll, we're going to return m.match. So we, we want match to produce an, a task of I action results. So um, I'm going to use named arguments. So I'm just going to say, on the nothing case, we'll return internal server error. That's you know, a helper method that produces one of those I action results. And in the other case, in the just case, I have to supply a little function that receives an integer as input argument and then returns an I action result as output. So I'm just going to write the Lambda expression that receives the ID and returns OK with that ID. So I don't have to go like ID.value or stuff like that before. This is completely safe. If you, you know, call the match method with the appropriate arguments and you're not trying to cheat it by passing in null or something like that, now this is never going to throw an exception. Well, never. You can always do funny things inside of this, but it's much safer um, to do it in this way. So, um, so now we're in the position to move repository create. And uh, basically, this is the, as you can tell, this is the, um, the code that produces that ID, that, that integer. So if I remove this method call from here and move it to somewhere else, I no longer have an ID. Uh, ID. I no longer have an int. Uh, so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to return a maybe of reservation. So I'm just saying if, if I decide not to accept the reservation, I'm, I'm going to return a maybe of reservation that's not populated. And otherwise, I'm returning a populated one. Uh, and again, we'll have to change the IMHD interface. Not so interesting. Uh, but what we have now is a maybe of reservation. And again, I'll, I'll remind you that the, um, the contract that we have with any HTTP client that calls this um, uh, behavior is that in the case where everything goes well, if we return 200 OK, we're supposed to put that integer, that reservation ID, into the 200 OK response body. And right now, we don't have a maybe of reservation. We, ha uh, we don't have a maybe of int. We have a maybe of reservation. So how do we turn a maybe of reservation into a maybe of int? Well, we have that select method, so we can just call that. And we can say, let's call select. And inside of select, we can call repository create. So this is, that, that Lambda expression is only going to run if the maybe uh, of reservation is populated, and it's not going to run if it's not. 
So instead of, again, having to write all those if-else expressions explicitly, you just rely on the fact that that's what select does. So now we have a maybe of int. Uh, well, not really. We, have, we actually have a maybe of a task of an int because this is asynchronous. Um, but um, we already established that task is a monad, maybe is a monad, and you can't infer that, that is, you know, a combination of those things will also form a monad. It's not always the case. It doesn't have to be the case, but in this case it is. So this is also a monad. So we're still in just monadic ter territory, so everything is good. Um, so we can match on that, and this gets a little bit, it looks a little bit awkward here. The code is not the prettiest, uh, but we can clean it up in a little while and it'll be pretty again. Uh, but uh, the funny thing is, though, that now we have a compiler warning. The compiler will actually tell us, uh, tell us then, you know, try accept, this async method lacks await operators. And it does. It says async up there, uh, but there's no await uh, going on at all. Nothing is awaitable. And, you know, I very deliberately aimed after this because I was really annoyed that my, you know, domain logic had to be asynchronous, but now it's not. So we can just, let's not have it asynchronous. Let's just turn it back into be synchronous domain decisions because that's all it needs to be. Um, and again, we'll go and change the image of the interface, but uh, let's just skip that. And the only change we need to do here is we just have to remove the away keyword uh, in front of try accept. So it just goes like this. All right. A few other things. We're basically done at this point, but we can go back and look at the maitre d' um, try accept implementation, and we'll notice uh, another thing, and that is that injected repository there is not being used. So we might as well just remove that dependency because that, that'll make our code simpler. So what we have now is, is close to something called a pure function. It's not quite pure because uh, on the penultimate line there, the, we have a little bit of state mutation going on. Uh, but this is something you could refactor and make it pure if you'd, if you'd like to. But the important part of this uh, state is that the try accept method here is completely deterministic. You know, what happens here is entirely determined by the input arguments. So you can completely control you know, in which uh, branch it'll execute just by making sure that it gets the right input arguments. Um, so this is interesting if you go and look at the post method on our controller here, because you might say, why do we even have that iMatrix dependency? And you may say, well, that's because I want to support unit testing. I want to be able to make sure that the matrix D has you know, deterministic behavior so that I can you know, reproduce various different test cases. But the implementation that we now have is already deterministic, which means you can completely control it just by making sure that it receives the appropriate input values. Um, so I'd say, well, let's not have that dependency. Let's just new, new up major D as we go along, because this will be as unit testable as the previous thing. You can, you can completely control what's hap what happens here because it's, it's deterministic. So I removed the I major D dependency. So um, if you do this consistently all over your code base, you don't need that interface. You just get rid of it. So that's why I said, don't worry about this, because in the end, it's not going to matter. Now, we still have the matrix d object, so we still have the domain logic encapsulated somewhere, um, but we don't need a, you know, an artificial interface uh, to model that sort of, of, of things. Now, the last thing we can do, yep, I have a couple of minutes. The last thing we can do is just to clean up the code a little bit, because it looks a little bit um, odd, particularly I don't like the match uh, thing with task from result and stuff like that. So we'll clean it up a little bit. And I, I don't have time to explain exactly how that cleanup works, but I have a blog post where you can see all the details uh, of that. Um, but basically what we have now, we just have a pipeline of things that's, that's executing one after the other. And you'll notice it starts by saying repository.read reservations, and then it just goes dot .select, dot .select many, and so on. So since we're using select and select many, there must be a monad um, being used here. And the monad is the task of T monad, or the asynchronous monad. So everything that needs to be asynchronous is asynchronous. You know, we start by calling repository.read reservations. That is an asynchronous read. And then we go uh, and call matrix to try accept. And notice we've just injected the try accept domain logic into this asynchronous context. And it doesn't know that it's running in that asynchronous context. Uh, it's an asynchronous uh, method call, but it's running in that context. And then you go in the next line there, you go, don't worry about what tra traverses. But you can see repository creates, it's there uh, towards the, the right there. And that again is an asynchronous write if it ever happens, uh, because it might not actually happen, because there's a maybe involved as well. 
And then the entire thing is asynchronous as well. It returns a task of action result. Uh, so all the stuff that needs to be asynchronous is still asynchronous. You are still asynchronous all the way, um, but we've inverted things in such a way that maitre d, you know, the domain logic, is not asynchronous. It doesn't have to be. It's just living inside that context. So how do we combine dependency injection with async and await without leaky abstractions? Well, we inject the desired behavior into the async monad. And we sort of knew this already because this, this is just a specialization on this more general answer. You inject the desired behavior into the monad. So behavior injection, not dependency injection. So, um, so that's basically it. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about this stuff, I have tons of articles on block.deploy.dk that will walk you through all of this, including all the code that I've shown you here today, and the code is on GitHub as well. Um, I'm out of time, so I'm not going to take questions, but I'll be around at the conference the entire day, and you can just come and talk to me and ask me questions, and I'll be happy to help you out in any way that I can. So thank you all for coming, and I hope you have a great day today.